Because of the shady algorithm on YouTube, I ask that everybody please like and comment on these videos. It really helps us, guys, and I want to bring this channel to a wider audience, which also allows us to bring niche strategy games to a wider audience. Take the time to like and comment, and I won't bother you again. Well, folks, I need to tell you about a game, and that game is Old World. Now, I have to say, when I first saw this game and took a look at it, I was like, this is just another 4X, I can't stand this, you know, more of the same, etc, etc. But in fact, in Old World, uh, we not only get a 4X game set in ancient times, which allows us to really follow sort of an ancient uh, focus, essentially, but we also have a dynastic simulator. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we actually have a simulator very similar to Crusader Kings, where you have courtiers, you have generals, you've got family members that can all take the throne or all completely change your entire culture just by their very presence. So I really love that aspect of the game. I think it makes it quite interesting. There's also a number of political decisions in game that you don't get with a lot of these 4Xs that I want to show you guys. Uh, and just to give you an idea of just how epic this can be, uh, let's take a look over here, for instance, at just our preset leader. Um, of course, we are playing with Babylonia, but we can actually select a kind of leader, sort of a kind of initial commander to lead our civilization. Now, eventually, of course, his son or daughter is going to take over if everything goes well. So make sure to select someone uh, or a skill that you truly feel connected to. You can also select this pick later archetype, and that way, as you play through the game, it'll actually develop your character. Well, enough of that. Let's jump into a standard game here and just take a look at what Old World has to offer. In many cases, your starting dynasty is going to involve, of course, selecting a starting city, much like just in any 4X game. But over here on the right side, you can actually see court members, and more importantly, you can see direct descendants. In this case, my brother Remus and I am Romulus, do the math. Um, are the first two, um, essentially, nobles here in Rome. Now, I'm going to set the city right there. Uh, we are next to a beautiful river. Um, and over here, another aspect of the game is you've got different classes of, um, of families. Now, sometimes, much like the Romans, you'll have the Claudians, the Julii, etc. If you're playing as the Babylonians, maybe you'll have uh, the horse archers, the zealots, um, the philosophers, etc. So these are different sort of groups that you need to keep fairly happy. Now I'm gonna go ahead and actually increase respect amongst the Valerius patrons, or specifically uh, build a city for them. And as you can see here, the court minister has now joined the court. And this guy can actually act as a governor in our new city of Rome. In fact, that's what I'm gonna do right now. Of course, we've got the standard 4X research screen there. Uh, but if I actually click on the city of Rome, I can select governor here, and I can grab that guy, Nonus the minister, and now he's going to be the governor of the city. He's going to improve the development of the city, but he's also going to grow as a character. So who knows? I mean, technically, it is possible for this guy to try and take control from us. Just a fascinating game, as I said before. And again, we already did assign that governor there to our cities. By the way, if you want that tutorial to help you, you can turn it off, keep it on. It's completely up to you. Um, but this is, of course, the start of the game. And again, much like any other 4X game, you're going to have a lot of resources around. One thing that's really cool about um, this one, though, is you don't necessarily have a situation where you have to click here on the city and build buildings. Um, the buildings are pretty much built by your workers. So when your workers are out here, the same workers that would irrigate a field or build a mine or things like that, they can still do those things. But they could also build theaters, pantheons, or whatever other buildings you're looking for. Even military uh, buildings um, are actually part of this. Again, as always, we do have um, early warriors, much like you would have in any, any of these 4X games. I'm going to just use my warrior and my explorer to pretty much uh, just jump around. In fact, I called it an explorer. It's actually a scout. 
um, but we're simply going to find new locations. Now, much like the Civilization games, you've got major powers and minor powers. We'll get to that in a bit. But the interesting there, thing there, the reason I can't move anymore, is we lack the requisite command points. And in fact, we have to gain legitimacy as rulers to be able to do more actions per turn. I just think that's a great touch there for a game like this. Decisions that you wouldn't be able to make in other games appear quite frequently in Old World. So, for instance, in the very beginning here of our civilization's growth, we actually discovered a band of survivors from another civilization. And we can, of course, resettle them in our tribe or even recruit them as hardened explorers. I think I'm going to actually invite them to our nation, and this gives us a worker um, to actually build improvements. And as you can see, there will be recommendations for which improvements to build. Uh, some locations obviously are going to be more profitable than others. Um, but ultimately, it is up to you. You saw all those um, positives and negatives um, for each of the items or each of the resources. There are also going to be specialized resources, so things that are particularly hard to get. Uh, precious metals, gems, things of that nature. And much like in other 4X games, you're going to have to leverage those uh, diplomatically and by commerce uh, against other civilizations. Another neat thing about the game is as you discover locations, uh, if you are the first person to stumble across, for instance, for instance, a large mountain or a river or even an ocean, you actually get to name that whatever you want. So as an example here, we found a lake. And not only does it add legitimacy, but we can actually name it whatever we want. So, I'm just going to call it Lake Maxentius. And there... Okay, yeah, nice. Uh, misspell it, Agrippa. That's great. Uh, Mac, Lake Maxentius. That's fine, too. The point being there that you can actually, of course, create these... Lo or discover these locations, not only name them, but gain legitimacy from them. And over time, as you're playing your game, you're going to remember this lake. You're going to remember this location, and it's going to have an importance to your civilization. So if you get into a war, perhaps you're going to want to defend it uh, just a little bit more than you would otherwise. Now, I did mention to you guys that this is a dynastic simulator, and that's what I really love about this game, on top of everything else. Uh, is this dynastic aspect right here. Now, currently, uh, King Romulus is the one in power with, of course, his brother King Remus here, the only part of our royal family. But we could, of course, get married, uh, and we could um, have children, or Prince Remus could have children, and we could pass on the inheritance to them. In fact, if we go over here um, to the laws, over time, we can discover new forms of government, uh, new methods of succession, where we can obviously try and apply those to our very own empire. And this is just such a massive game, guys. I mean, I can't go over everything in this uh, review video, uh, but this is a look at the tech tree. Uh, there is just so much here, and actually, if I had to explain everything, uh, I think it would take, it would probably be a one hour long video just to give the basic explanation. Uh, suffice it to say, there is just so much here to work with, and uh, it's really, really enjoyable um, to work with it. Now, much like a proper dynastic game, what would a proper dynastic game be without just a little bit of intrigue? And we actually have this character in our court, uh, Oligarch Gaius the Scholar, um, and he's set to be wed. Now, of course, he wants us to attend his wedding, and we can all we can support it or we can go against it. But depending on what family he's from, um, which in this case seems the Valerians, um, this could cause problems for us later. In this case, I won't stand in the way of their marriage, uh, but of course, that decision is entirely up to you to make. You can also make decisions with other major powers, uh, and I mentioned I was going to touch upon that earlier. So basically, you've got large nations, then you've got like small tribal nations that you can subjugate or work with. It's pretty much up to you. It's pretty similar to the, um, I guess it's the vassal state or the suzerain state in civilization, um, and in terms of Persia, um, you know, we can decide to be friendly with them or we can decide to, over time, go to war with them. In this case, I kind of approach with some indifference um, and we're just not going to really say much to them at all. But at least we know where they are. 
There we go. That's what I was talking about, the tribes. And in this case, our first tribe is the Numidians. So we could work with these folks, pay them off, etc. Or we could get an army and take over that area ourselves and even establish a city on the exact same location. Now, the way the game works is it goes year by year. And I think, like, in terms of a dynastic simulator like this, that's perfect timing. Um, because you cycle through your leaders, not quickly, but it doesn't take forever either. I'm going to go ahead and grab another settler because we need to continue trying to expand here. And let's head to our next unit. This is just an explorer unit. Take a look. Look at all these wonderful resources. In fact, even with our explorers, as long as we are close to our original settlement locations, we can harvest some of these resources before we start properly um, farming them. Damn new Midians. Let's end that year, folks. And as I said, every turn is one year. So, so much can happen in that time period, of course. Um, in this case, not much has. We did. We don't have a wife yet. Um, we are still unmarried. Uh, so, obviously, you know, we want to be careful here with uh, Julius. If we die, Prince Remus takes over. Now, here we go, our second city. And as you can see here, we can select specifically what... Um, class of citizen or what family is going to inherit this area now it looks like the valerians already really like us let's found a julian city right here over time as you either discover of course new locations or as you gain victories in battle the actual stats that your leader has are going to increase and also his nickname will increase in fact if you're good enough at this game eventually you will get to that great title now often the things you actually have to decide um will be in accordance with other civilizations in this case we actually found an egyptian now we can of course escort the caravan to the to the direction of egypt and of course improve our relations with this faction we can negotiate an exchange and actually get some gold out of this or we can even kill the egyptian get a bunch of gold and lose opinion with them now we are rome in this particular let's play i am not keeping that person around i definitely want that gold i think that's a pretty easy decision but the reason i showed you guys that is because i like how this game forces you into conflict with the other civilizations in a lot of other 4x games you're never really forced into conflict and this game kind of pushes you slowly but surely in that direction now let's say you don't want to go through the hassle of playing an entire like 4x game you know with a bunch of different civilizations and stuff let's say you just want to focus on like one thing specifically well, that's another great thing. The scenarios in this game allow you to even play from a historical perspective. Now, there's one below this one, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and type in Heroes of the Aegean in the uh, chat or in the comments because this is the DLC coming out next. I can't show you anything from it, unfortunately, but suffice it to say, this just lets you go from like a scenario basis instead of necessarily doing an entire world map and uh, lets you have a lot of fun, of course, just playing from that perspective instead of the entire game now i want to be very clear guys old world has so much to it that we didn't touch upon the wars in this game are incredible i will mention also that old world well it is an ancient world game so keep that in mind you know in other words um if you're looking for like something that lets you get into modern times etc maybe not the game for you uh, but if you like this ancient period and you want to explore it and see where it goes see how incredible it gets well then of course that's always an option and as you can he see here with this particular scenario we actually have to recreate the story of carthage in fact we're right here on the northeastern african coast very close in fact on the exact spot of the original city Hopefully I got you as obsessed about this game as I am. And I really hope to see you guys playing this in the future. Um, like I said, um, I completely fell in love with this game. I was shocked. I was not expecting to like this. Again, I'm not a huge fan of 4X games. I find them to be pretty simplistic um, in the dynastic sense and also in the role-playing sense. And I think this game touches upon both of those itches. Like I said, there is so much I haven't shown. But if you want to see more Old World make sure to let me know in the comments. This is a game that I would love to play on this channel, love to do a massive series on, and see just how far we can get as any number of different civilizations. 
Take care, folks. Like, comment, subscribe. It really helps me out.